party room, and I don't need to articulate to you Order, across, the Senate, across the Senate we chamber. Are, we have hit 2 p.m. You will be in continuation. We'll move to questions without notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Workers at ASC in South Australia have been left to endure two Christmases without any certainty from this minister about the future of their jobs after she broke her promise that a decision on the future location of full cycle docking work would be ma made by the end of 2019. Why does this minister continue to keep 700 South Australian naval shipbuilders in the dark because of her broken promise? And will she now commit to making a decision this year? The Minister for Defence. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator Wong for this question on this most important issue for our nation's security. This government is absolutely committed to keeping Australia and Australians safe. As an island nation, we rely on maritime trade for our security and our prosperity. That means Australia's naval capability is essential to our enduring national interest. The Morrison government is keeping Australia safe with our $183 billion naval shipbuilding plan, which is the largest regeneration of the Navy since World War II. More than 70 vessels will be built right here in Australia using point Australian order. workers. Senator, Senator, and this is order. Creating Senator Reynolds, sorry, Senator, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Direct relevance. This relates to this minister's commitment this government's commitment to make a decision by the end of 2019. Workers have been waiting for two Christmases. I am asking about when a decision will be made as to the location of full cycle docking. It's a very specific question. I've allowed you to remind the minister of the specific nature of the question, and I call Senator Reynolds to continue. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And like so many of these important issues, context is absolutely critical. It is absolutely critical because Order. this government is creating over 15,000 direct jobs in our naval shipbuilding industry. We will make all of these decisions, every single one of them, in relation to the build of more than 70 vessels, the sustainment and maintenance of our current fleet and our future fleet in the order and at the time they need to be made, which is what this government has done continually. As has been said at estimates and publicly, this is a decision, this, this is a decision uh, that even if we did make a decision to change, it is still five to six years away. In the meantime, what is this government doing? We have fixed we have order. fixed that valley of death of jobs order. you created in South Australia. You commissioned not a single, not a single order. Australian built vessel in our nation. You commissioned not a single one. You didn't progress a submarine, a future submarine program. And this government has done it. We are creating 15,000 jobs. There is not going to be less jobs in South Australia. There are thousands, there are already thousands more than when you left government. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. This minister has also broken her promise that the strategic partnering agreement for the future submarines would be amended by the end of last year to include a 60 per cent spending commitment for local content. Can the minister tell Australian naval shipbuilding workers and businesses why she has broken yet another promise to them? Senator Reynolds. Uh, look, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, can I tell you one thing? I will never, ever, ever, in any of our defence procurement contracts, I will never, ever agree to any terms or conditions that goes against Australia's interest in delivering this capability. I am frustrated and I'm very disappointed that Naval Group have yet been able to finalise this contract with defence. But it will not be done. It will not be done at the expense of Australian jobs and Australian industry. This capability is far too important for our nation to do such. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Morrison government has also broken its promise to release an update to the Naval Shipbuilding Plan by the end of 2020, which was to include, and I quote, further detail on the critical role of Australia's shipbuilding industry in delivering this plan. Why has this minister broken yet another promise? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And again, can I reiterate to everybody here and everybody in Australia, every single cent we spend of the taxpayers' money 
Every single contract we enter into for our naval shipbuilding plan, over $183 billion worth over the next few decades. Every single thing we do is about sovereign capability and about building sovereign defence capability in our nation. You do not have to wait for a piece of paper, Senator Wong, to see this government's commitment. 15,000 jobs, Senator, 70 Senator Reynolds, vessels. Senator Wong, that is our Senator, commitment. Senator Reynolds, please. I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. The point of order is this minister and this government's own commitment to relieve, release the update to the Naval Shipbuilding Plan. I'm asking why it hasn't been released by the time she said it would be. Senator Birmingham on the point of order. Mr President, Senator Wong um, has repeated part of her question, but she has also used the opportunity to extrapolate. In any event, Senator Reynolds is clearly being directly relevant to issues that relate to the Naval Shipbuilding Plan and is the entire nature of the content that she has had in her answer to date. I'm listening carefully to the Minister's answer, but I tend to agree with Senator Birmingham um, that the Minister's answer thus far, while it could be debated after question time as is appropriate, um, is being directly relevant. She has 26 seconds remaining to answer. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I don't know where the opposition have been hiding, but the past 12 months we have been undertaking, the globe has been undertaking a large health-induced, a pandemic-induced economic crisis. This government is working to continue to deliver our naval shipbuilding plan, and we are. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister advise the Senate on the changes to working age payments announced today and how they will benefit 1.95 million Australians who are currently receiving working age payments? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for his question. Um, the pandemic, as we all know, caused a once-in-a-lifetime disruption to our labour market, and we used our comprehensive welfare system uh, to support Australians who found themselves unemployed through the emergency support measures that were put in place last year. Today, we announced that the transition from those temporary measures into a more permanent setting. So we know that the recovery of the Australian economy is now well underway, and so we no longer are relying on those temporary supports, which have sustained us over the last 12 months. So on the 31st of March, the coronavirus supplement and associated measures uh, will uh, come to an end. And in its place, in recognition that the Australian economy has changed as a result of the pandemic that has impacted our country over the last 12 months, uh, we are seeking to increase the working age payments base rate uh, permanently by an amount of $50 per fortnight uh, per, per payment. This is the single largest increase in working age payments or unemployment benefits since 1986. Uh, and that is, it will be a 9.7 per cent increase year on year from April 2020 to April 21. Uh, but in addition to increasing uh, the, the payment rate, we will also be uh, increasing the income free area to $150. And this means Every Australian on working age payments will be able to keep the first $150 that they earn in a fortnight before their payment is reduced by one cent. What we're seeking to do here is to get the balance right between supporting people as they look for work, but also making sure that we put the right incentives in place for people to take up work, and we also seek to remove the disincentives that are put in place uh, for people to not take a job. This is a $9 billion investment in working age payments, uh, and it is absolutely uh, essential that we continue to support Order. our working Senator age Rustin. payments. Senator recipients. Sullivan, a supplementary question. Could the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is incentivising unemployed Australians to seek work? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Well, um, the Morrison government's priority is giving people the support they need to get them into work. That is why we've made the decision today uh, to increase the, uh, the income-free area uh, to $150 per fortnight. As I said, this means that a recipient can earn $150 without losing a cent of their payment. Um, the income-free area will allow people to work about a day a fortnight at the minimum wage before their payments reduced. During the pandemic, we, uh, we saw temporary settings, including the income-free area that was increased, actually deliver very, very positive results with a significant increase in the number of people who were reporting earnings. And we know we know that people who report earnings are twice as likely to transition off payment 
than those that don't report any earnings at all. So we will continue uh, to support, and, uh, and we are confident that we will be able, through this measure, to get people off payment and into work, because we know that getting Order. people off Senator welfare Rustin. is important. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate what temporary measures will remain in place to continue to support Australians as we recover from the pandemic? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, in addition to the uh, the ongoing measures that were announced this morning and the measures that uh, Senator Cash also announced this morning, we are also uh, um, seeking for this Parliament over the coming weeks to agree to the temporary extension of the one week, uh, the ordinary waiting period, which is a one week period that people normally have to serve before coming on to payment to make sure that we continue to give access to direct and immediate access to anybody who's coming on to payments because we know that localised outbreaks are still potentially a risk to this country. So we know that also that there are likely to be people who are going to have to uh, isolate because they have contracted coronavirus or are caring for somebody uh, and are required to isolate. So we will also be seeking in this place to extend the provision to enable people under those provisions to continue to be able to uh, get access to payment um, under the, uh, as long as they meet the existing eligibility criteria. But we know 93 per cent of people have got their jobs back, so Order. we look forward. Senator Rustin, time for the answers expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Is the Minister aware that when asked if she would release the Minister from any privacy concerns and allow her to speak freely, her former staff member, Ms. Higgins, replied, and I quote, of course? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Mm. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, the answer is, of course, I have. Uh, but as I've said on many occasions in this chamber, Brittany's story is hers and hers alone to tell publicly. Brittany, Brittany has said that tomorrow Order. she is speaking with the AFP, and I believe, I, I believed it last week, and I believe this week, to the bottom of my heart, that. These discussions should be had with the AFP, and of course I stand ready once uh, Ms Higgins has gone to the AFP to discuss these matters with her further. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Is the minister aware that her former staff member Ms Higgins has also said, and I quote, the government has questions to answer for their own conduct? Senator Reynolds. I, look, I thank you very much for that question, Mr President, and I thank Senator Gallagher for that question. I think much has been said about this issue publicly and in this place over the last two weeks. And there are many, many issues, and there are many, many issues arising from that commentary. Uh, some of that is rightly the issue is now an issue for the AFP uh, to, and for Ms. Britain, for Ms Higgins to pursue that with the AFP. As the, as the Prime Minister has said, there will be uh, an inquiry led um, by the head of Prime Minister and Cabinet into the Order. specifics and the circumstances of this inquiry. And that is absolutely the right place for all of these matters, uh, particularly the procedural matters, to be discussed. I understand that Senator Birmingham, Minister Birmingham, is working with the Labor Party and all parties in Order. this chamber in this parliament Order. on a broader inquiry into the cultural reforms and procedural reforms Order. that Senator clearly that we all agree Order. need to Order. occur. Senator Reynolds' time has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Ms Higgins has said in relation to the minister that, and I quote, I don't think she's ever respected my privacy, so her sudden concern for it now, I find it patently false. Given Ms Higgins has made her wishes well known, will the minister stop using Ms Higgins' privacy to hide from her accountability to this place and answer questions asked of her? Senator Reynolds. Look, thank you very much, Mr President. And I respectfully disagree with the senator's assessment of the situation. Senator Se Order, order. I've got Senator Seawitt has the call. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Social Services, Minister Rustin. Through order. you. Order. Sorry, I, I need to be able to hear Senator Seawitt. I need. 
I did not hear anything. There should be no interjections from my right or my left. I did not hear anything from my right. Senator Rennick, Senator Rennick, I was calling the chamber to order. Senator Seawitt, please commence again. Thank you. Uh, Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Social Services, Minister Rustin. Through you, Minister, can you live on the new payment of job seeker of $44 a day? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Seawitt, for your question. Um, I think I've said on a number of times in, in this place that um, living without a job would be extremely difficult, and that is why this government has been so incredibly focused on um, getting the economy to recover so that jobs can be recreated, so that we have an opportunity to get people who find themselves unemployed, who are on working age payments, uh, back into to work. Uh, and this morning's announcement were very much around making sure that we have a targeted response, a targeted package of measures to ensure that we are giving people the best opportunity, the best Order. incentives and the best support to be able to get them back into work. Uh, so, Senator Seawitt, um, we, were, we were very, um, very uh, concerned about making sure uh, that we uh, got the balance right Senator in McKinn. terms Senator of McKinn. being able uh, to support Senator Australians Rebecca. who find themselves on working age payments. We need to support people while they're looking to work for work, but we also need to make sure that we are creating the right incentives to encourage them to look for that work and also to remove the disincentives, which is part of the package of, uh, of measures that have been announced by Senator Cash, to try and make sure that we don't disincentivise people from working. But most particularly, we need to make sure that our system, our working age payment system, uh, is fair and it's sustainable. Fair and sustainable for the people who need it and the taxpayers who pay for it. So today what we have done is we have, uh, we have increased the, the base uh, level of payment, um, but equally, as Senator Seawood would well know, our, uh, the Australian uh, working age payment system, our welfare system, is a very comprehensive and targeted system. And so we have an, a range of different supplements and allowances and supports that are in place that recognise the unique situation and conditions that Australians have whether it be that they have children and get family tax benefit, whether they are renters and they are able to get access to the um, Commonwealth rental assistance, um, or whether there are Senator myriad Rustin, of other— time for the answer has expired. Senator See, what a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Um, through you, Mr President, does the government acknowledge that 1.5 million Australians on the job seeker and youth allowance payment will be living in poverty from April? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, uh, what I can say to um, Senator Seawitt through you, Mr President, that um, on the 1st of April, as an ongoing measure, um, the Commonwealth Government will be putting in place, over the forward estimates, a $9 billion increase in, uh, in payments to people who find themselves on working age payments. This includes people who are on the job keeper payment, the, uh, the job seeker payment, and also those who are on youth allowance, youth allowance other, uh, students, uh, young people, uh, people, single people um, with, uh, with children. Uh, there are a number, uh, every one of the 1.95 million Australians who currently rely on our working age payment system will receive an increase of $50 per fortnight as of the 1st of April. But as I was saying uh, to you in the previous question, Senator C, as you well know, there are a number of other targeted um, supplements and supports that are available for people that recognise the unique situation Order. that different Senator people Rustin, find themselves time for the in. The answer has expired. Senator C, what a final supplementary question. How long does it does the minister estimate it's going to take the 1.5 million Australians currently condemned by this government to live in poverty to find work, given at the present time the figures that are available, there's only 175,000 job vacancies. Aye. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Seawitt. Well, of course, um, there are there are a number of uh, of measures um, in relation to, uh, to to job availability and job vacancies, as, as Senator Cash would well know, uh, and you only refer to one of them. But what we do know, Mr. President, is that the most important thing that a government can do is to make sure the settings in the economy are right, so businesses can create jobs, 
Governments don't in and of themselves create jobs. What we do is we support our businesses in our economy, our big businesses, our small businesses, so that they are encouraged to have uh, to employ people. And that is why our hiring credits program has is been put in place because we know young people were more impacted by this pandemic than others. That's why we've got the job trainer program in place because we know some of the jobs that were pre-pandemic may not come back post-pandemic, but we know there is a great need for other jobs, and that's why we are seeking to retrain and to reskill those people that are on payment now so that they can take up the jobs of the future. Order. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, uh, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister update the Senate on the national rollout of the COVID vaccine, particularly into regional Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, um, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Macdonald, for the question. This week is a historic week for Australia and all Australians, Mr President. The mass vaccine rollout began yesterday in aged care homes and hospital hubs for border, quarantine and frontline health workers. I'm also pleased to be able to report that a second shipment of Pfizer vaccine arrived in Australia overnight. This week, health professionals will deliver vaccines to aged care residents across 240 facilities in 190 towns and regional centres across the country. In your home state, Senator Macdonald, aged care residents in regional centres such as Toowoomba, Kearney Spring, Harristown, Glenvale, Bundaberg, Millbank and Kepnock will receive their vaccines. Under the Australian Government's plan for aged care residents, we're on track to be vaccinated by April, Mr. President. <clears throat> we encourage all Australians, when, you, when your turn comes, to take the opportunity <laughs> to, li in line with, to line up with, to receive the vaccine, Mr. President. That will protect you, will protect your families, and the whole country from major cities to rural communities. As the Prime Minister has said, Mr. President, we are going to make our Australian way back through this pandemic, and the Australian way has proved to be, when you look around the world one of the most effective there is. People are relying on us to protect their livelihoods, to protect their lives, to maintain the health of the country, to make sure we roll out this vaccination program, Mr President, and we will do that. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. Can the minister please outline the expert process our medical professionals are undertaking in this vaccine rollout? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and thank you, Senator Macdonald. Order. We want to give confidence to the Australian people, and we're doing that by showing that these vaccines have been through a full and thorough assessment by our medical regulator, the TGA, and that they are safe. As the Prime Minister demonstrated by being vaccinated on Sunday, Mr. President, he's not asking anyone to do anything that he's not prepared to do himself. Mr President, today we saw the Leader of the Opposition vaccinated. He too is demonstrating his confidence in the vaccine. As more Australians receive it, as we've seen around the world and is shown to be safe and effective, that will also raise the confidence across the community and encourage more Australians to get vaccinated. Our key message, Mr President, is that it's safe, is that it's effective, it will help protect you but it will also help protect your loved Order. ones. Senator Colbeck. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. Can the minister also update the Senate on the Morrison-McCormack government's plan to record who has and hasn't had the vaccine? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I can confirm that the Australian Immunisation Register will be the record for all vaccinations for Australians, and that record will form the basis of the vaccination certificate certificate that all Australians will be able to use, Mr President, including visa holders. Your immunisation history statement sourced from the Australian Immunisation Re Register is available right now. You can access it from the Medica Medicare Express Plus, from MyGov or call or visit Services Australia and get a paper record. Mr President, doctors, Nurses, pharmacists and other health professionals will record vaccines given to you or your child on the Australian Immunisation Register. Once you have had the required doses of a COVID-19 vaccine, 
a COVID-19 immunisation status will show your immunisation history statement, and that can be used as your proof of vaccination. Order. Senator Colbeck. Senator Ayres. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Given Ms Higgins has released the minister from any privacy, privacy concerns, will the minister now answer the question she was asked yesterday? At any time, did the minister disclose to any other minister that her former staff member, Ms Higgins, had made allegations that she was raped in the minister's office? If yes, which ministers and when? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much uh, for that question. And again, as I said yesterday, there are a number of these matters uh, that, after Ms Higgins has gone to the AFP tomorrow, I will, I will discuss with the AFP and I will also discuss with the various other inquiries. As I've already said, I did not at any time disclose— Mr President, I'm happy to answer Order. the question. Order. Order. I, Order on my as, I've, I, as I have affirmed in this, this place, I did not advise the Prime Minister because it was not my place to do so. I also did not advise Senator, Mac Senator Cash at any time because, again, it was not my agency to do so. I had, one I had a discussion with the Special Minister of State at the time. Uh, to the best of my recollection, it was not about this matter. It was about my second staff member. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Given Ms Higgins has released the minister from any privacy concerns, will the minister now tell the Senate on what date did the minister first become aware that her chief of staff had sought advice from the Department of Finance about, handling of an, uh, about the handling of an alleged sexual assault? On, wait, on what date did the minister first see the advice and what action did she take? Senator Reynolds. Uh, I thank uh, Senator Ayres for that and, uh, Mr President, through you. Uh, my understanding is that my Chief of Staff was provided a report of the access to my office uh, either by the Department of Finance or by DPS, and my recollection was it was on Wednesday the 27th. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. Well, I don't think that was the question that I asked. Given Ms Higgins has released the minister from any privacy concerns, will the minister now tell the Senate why, when Ms Higgins was asked if she wanted to go to the police at the meeting with the minister and her chief of staff on the 1st of April 2019, why was she told, and I quote, we need to know now? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, look, thank you very much, uh, Senator Ayres, for that. And as I have said repeatedly in this chamber, uh, Ms Higgins' recollections and her story are hers to tell. It is not my place in this chamber, in this chamber, to, uh, order. to speculate Senator, further Senator on Ayres, that. Senator Reynolds, I, I have Senator Ayres on a, on a point of order. Order is uh, relevance, Mr. President. It's it's not remotely relevant for the minister to explain why she'd prefer not to answer a question. Um, if the minister is addressing the question and providing reasoning for her answer, and I believe that relates to the terms of the question, I don't believe I can rule that out as not being directly relevant. Um, you've, allowed, you, you've reminded the minister of the question, but there, I can't instruct a minister how to answer a question. I call the minister to continue. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And as I have said a number of times in this chamber over the last two weeks, uh, those opposite are asking me questions premised on the assertions of facts. This is, not, this is not the place, nor is it the time, for me to discuss or debate the accuracy of some of the assertions of those opposite. The time for me to do that is with the Australian Federal Police and also the other inquiries underway. I still believe I owe Brittany her agency and her privacy. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. In light of today's announcement of the Morrison government's plan to permanently, permanently increase the job seeker rate, how will the government ensure that unemployed Australians remain engaged with the labour market and looking for jobs? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Carr for the question. And as Senator Carr knows, Australia's 
economic recovery from COVID-19, Mr. President, is well. Order. Sorry. Well, so I admire Senator Carr immensely. Uh, it is Senator uh, Senator Scar. That uh, I'm, I'm 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 not sure who uh, who would be more insulted, Senator Carr. Senator or... Cash, to continue. Mr. Scar, it is my great Western Australian accent that I'm so often Please reminded continue, about in this place. Uh, but, Mr. President, uh, at least one can laugh at oneself. Australia's economic recovery is well underway, Mr. President. And in fact, the recent ABS jobs data shows that employment increased by over 29,000 jobs last month. And this, Mr. President, included a 59,000 increase in full-time jobs. And this, of course, is a direct result of the Morrison government's economic recovery plan, which has provided unprecedented levels of support to Australian households and businesses. As our economic recovery continues, though, it is important that we provide Australians who have lost their job or alternatively have had their hours reduced with the support they need to get into fulfilling employment. And that is why today we've made a number of announcements in relation to the strengthening of mutual obligation requirements. Uh, the government, the Morrison government, firmly believes that the best form of welfare is a job. And that is why we will put in place the necessary measures to ensure those uh, that don't have a job at the moment are doing everything that they can to become work ready. Or alternatively, if they are offered suitable employment, they are able to take that suitable employment up. We've made a number of changes, Mr President, and that includes the number of job searches that a person needs to undertake. Uh, we're also establishing an employer reporting line so that people who actively say no to suitable work are able to be followed up by job providers or alternatively the department. We're also allowing people to participate uh, in short training courses, for example, something on the job trainer course. It's all about ensuring that we have the right mechanisms in place so that those people who are on welfare are becoming as job ready as we can get them to move Order. into work. Senator Cash, Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Could the minister update the Senate? on why the recovery in the Australian labour market makes it an appropriate time to strengthen mutual obligation requirements for job seekers. Senator Cash. Thank you very much. And, uh, thank you, Senator Scar. Uh, Mr President, while the unprecedented events of last year they obviously required additional flexibility when it came to mutual obligation. And the government worked with job seekers, and as you know, we lifted those mutual obligation requirements as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. But now what we're seeing is the jobs are returning to the economy. Over 800,000 jobs have actually returned. That's about 93 per cent of the jobs lost during COVID-19 have returned to the economy. Hours worked have now recovered by 74.5 million hours since the peak of the pandemic in May. And of course, we've seen job ads reach higher levels uh, than before the pandemic, with SEEK, ANZ and the National Skills Commission continuing to show increases in recruitment activity. And so, Mr President, when you are of the belief that the best form of welfare is a job, everything you do needs to be focused on ensuring people become as job Order. ready Senator as Cash. possible. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Following the changes announced today, why should Australians who are returning to the labour market have confidence, confidence about their ability to find a job? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as I said in answer to Senator Scar's first question, Australia's economic recovery is well underway. And uh, we only need to look at the recent labour force figures for January 2021, with the recent ABL's job data showing that employment increased by over 29,000 that month, including a 59,000 increase in full-time jobs. And of course, that is, as I said, a direct result of the Morrison government's economic recovery plan, which has, as we know, provided unprecedented levels of support uh, to Australian households, but of course, Australian businesses. As I said, we've seen over 800,000 jobs. That's around 93% of the jobs lost during COVID-19 return to the economy. We're also seeing uh, consumer confidence and business confidence and jobs ads grow to levels higher than before COVID-19. Uh, the best form of welfare is a job, and we will do everything as a government to get people into jobs, Order. because that's Senator where Cash. they belong. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Birmingham. 
I've actually got a favour to ask you, Minister. I've got a friend who's looking for a job. He's a lovely bloke. Everyone agrees with that. You'd like him. Could you tell me whether there's any $400,000 a year taxpayer-funded jobs you're looking to fill with an ex-member of parliament? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, I thank Senator Lambie for her question. Uh, the, uh, the government indeed fills some jobs, and there have been some distinguished former members of parliament who have filled some jobs over a period of time. From all sides of politics at different times as well, I, uh, I note. Of course, far more important than the jobs that the Australian government fills are the jobs that are filled by the private sector across Australia, creating sustainable opportunities for Australians, a growing economy. And what we're pleased to have achieved as a government prior to the pandemic was a record level of employment across Australia. During our first six years in office, we saw employment grow by 1.5 million additional jobs. 1.5 million additional jobs, thanks to strong growth across the private sector, thanks to strong growth in Australian businesses who took on more Australians and created more opportunities. And in doing so, what those Australians, what those Australians enjoyed was, of course, the opportunity of work the opportunity to provide for their family, the opportunity to plan for the future, Order. and the Senator benefit Birmingham, that provided, I have, Mr. I have President. Senator Birmingham, I have Senator Lambie on a point of order. Senator Lambie, a uh, point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. I was just, um, I like to be informed in here, that's wonderful, but I just wanted to know whether there are any $400,000 a year taxpayer-funded jobs that he's looking to fill that may involve being an ex-member of parliament, yes or no? I've allowed you to restate your question, Senator Lambie. Um, I, I'm going to take the minister as being relevant due to the nature of the question, um, unless you object further and are demanding a very specific answer. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. So, so Mr President, having addressed those issues at the start of the, uh, the answer, the point Order. is that through having achieved all of that extra jobs growth across the Australian economy, it created the situation, Mr President, where the welfare dependency among working age Australians was at its lowest level ever. At its lowest level ever. Order. That we had record numbers of taxpayers across Australia. That we had achieved indeed a participation rate at its highest level and crucially women's workforce participation at its highest level as well. They are the jobs our government is overwhelmingly focused on delivering for order. Australians. I have Senator, Lambie on, I have Senator Lambie on a point of order. Senator Lambie on a point of order. Uh, thank you. I just, I just, uh, are they what you're talking about now? Is that taxpayer-funded jobs, or you're just going on the loose, or, Minister? Order. Um, <laughs> Senator Birmingham, to continue. I'm pleased to say the vast majority of the jobs our government has seen created under our watch are in the private sector. Yeah, yeah. Businesses growing across Australia, creating more opportunities for more Australians to get ahead, and that's our focus for the Order, economic recovery Senator too. Birmingham. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In the interest of full disclosure, because I'm all about full disclosure up here, there's a few things I should let you know. When he was a member of parliament, he lobbied the immigration minister to get the brother of a political donor an Australian visa to avoid jail time for criminal conspiracy, violent crime, drug importation ex and extortion. Should I get him to send in his resume, Minister? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, many people send their resumes, but it doesn't change the fact that our government is focused resolutely on job creation opportunities for all Australians. That was our focus prior to the pandemic. Through the pandemic, our focus has been on saving and securing the jobs, the businesses, the opportunities of Australians to keep them safe in a health context and secure in an economic context. And now, as we emerge Order. through the different stages of Order. recovery from the pandemic, we are focused on that job creation Order. agenda again. Job creation overwhelmingly occurring in the Australian private sector. Job creation that is seeing some 93 per cent of those Australians who lost their jobs or reduced to zero hours around this time last year have now got their work back. Australians who have actually back in employment thanks to the good management that has been provided right across the country of an enormous global challenge from which Australia can hold our head high. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Just one more thing, and I'm sure it's only small. 
My mate took a job as a lobbyist while he was also a member of parliament. He didn't disclose it, but apparently that's okay in here because we have no standards. Also as a lobbyist and a member of parliament, he was lobbying his colleagues to oppose his own government legislation because his client was paying him to do it. Do you think that will be a problem still to put his resume in, Minister? Senator Birmingham. Oh, Mr President, I, I, mean, I, I refrain from the point of order that, uh, that hypothetical questions are out of order. No, because it's the truth. And Mr President, the focus remains very clear for our government. The focus remains very clear for our government, as I've said, on continuing to build the economic recovery for Australia. And people can want to be distracted by other issues. Our government will not be distracted. We will continue to focus on delivering the vaccine rollout that Senator Colbeck has spoken of each and every day over the last couple of weeks, the crucial steps in economic recovery that will be underpinned by that vaccine rollout, the most complicated logistical exercise undertaken in Australia's probably peacetime history, according to many of the experts, but we're getting on and doing that in cooperation with the states and territories, in cooperation with health authorities. We're getting on with continuing to support Australian businesses, and all of this is about continuing to focus on the things Order. that really Senator, matter, I have which Senator, is keeping Australia safe and reset. secure. I have, the clock should have about ten, uh, eight or ten seconds left. Senator Lambie, on a point of order. Uh, yeah, um, with all due respect, Mr. President, President the relevance. Can you just answer the question? Just, just let's get some standards in here for once. Senator, Senator Lambie, um, I'm, I'm going to not rule the minister not being directly relevant due, due to the nature of the question and call on him to continue if he wishes. For I, I'll go to Senator Polly then. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. When asked yesterday about her meeting with the Assistant Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police, she said, and I quote, everything that was done was with the knowledge and with her concurrence. Ms Higgins has said, and I quote, I had no idea she was meeting with the AFP about my sexual assault. Will the minister now correct the record? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, look, thank you, Mr. President. I stand by what I said in the chamber yesterday. And just to be very clear, um, <clears throat> I met on the 1st of April with uh, the AFP, Brittany, and my then Chief of Staff. As I've said uh, in this chamber previously, during the course of that meeting, it became apparent to me that the matter was more serious than a security breach to which I had been previously advised. Uh, that same day, I organised for Brittany to meet with the AFP, something which I have been advised did occur. Uh, by way of follow-up and clarification, I met briefly with the Australian Federal Police on the 4th of April at their request. Uh, I commenced the meeting alone and I was then joined for a brief period by my Chief of Staff. Senator Polly, a supplementary question. After misleading the Senate yesterday, the minister had to correct the record and confirm her chief of staff had attended her meeting with the AFP assistant commissioner. Why did the minister mislead the Senate by saying she had met with the assistant commissioner alone? Senator Reynolds. Uh, just to be totally clear, and I'll just say again to show that there's no, uh, no misunderstanding, uh, I did meet with the Australian Federal Police twice. The first one was on the 1st of April with Brittany and my then Chief of Staff. Uh, and as I've said, uh, then it's my understanding that Brittany then met with the AFP uh, out of the office and uh, not in my presence. And by the way of follow-up, uh, at their request, I met briefly with the Australian Federal Police, with the uh, Assistant Commissioner, on the 4th of April. I commenced the meeting alone and then my Chief of Staff joined me at the very end of the meeting. Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. The Minister failed to disclose her meeting with the Assistant Commissioner of the AFP until the Prime Minister revealed that fact in House Question Time, misled the Senate by saying she met with the Assistant Commissioner alone, and misled the Senate by saying Ms Higgins was aware of the meeting. When will the Minister be honest and her conduct in response to the alleged rape of a staff member in her office. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, Mr. President, I've, I've answered that same question twice, 
And as I've said, for complete clarity, there were two meetings. And my apologies if that was not clear yesterday, but uh, again, I've, I've been very clear. And if, you, and if for, the, Order. for this Order. chamber's benefit, if you would like me to clarify Order. that a third time, I would happily do so. But I met on the 1st of April with Brittany and my then chief of staff. Um, I therefore, and at part of that meeting, I organised for Brittany at her request and her agency to meet separately with the Australian Federal Police. And then on the 4th of April, by way of follow-up, at the request of the AFP, I met with the Assistant Commissioner alone and then my Chief of Staff joined that meeting, to the best of my recollection, at the end of that meeting. Senator Mackenzie. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Science, Technology, Senator Seselja. The Liberal and Nationals government has committed $1.5 billion to the modern manufacturing strategy to assist Australian manufacturers across six national priority areas to scale up, improve competitiveness and build more resilient supply chains. Food and beverage uh, is included as a national manufacturing pro priority, supporting our world-leading agricultural industries, and that's fantastic news. But can the minister advise what the strategy provides for our high-quality, sustainable fibre industries? including forestry, wool and cotton. The Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, thank you, and I thank Senator McKenzie for the question. Uh, the first pillar of our strategy is getting the economic conditions right for businesses in all manufacturing sectors to succeed. And that's what we want to see happening, and that includes every area of our agricultural sector, because we understand how vital our farmers, fishers and foresters are to our regions and to our nation. Uh, now, when our manufacturing sector grows and we value add here at home, it provides more opportunity for our agricultural sector. Getting the economic conditions right is the first pillar of our modern manufacturing strategy, and that's what's happening across the board. For example, the extension of the instant asset write-off is seeing manufacturers invest in new equipment, upgrade production lines and bring Work, bring work home to Australia. Now, the budget also includes a record investment in skills, plans to make energy more affordable and reliable, support to open up trade markets and a fairer, simpler industrial relations framework. Now, these are the building blocks that will assist every sector of manufacturing. And I know the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology met with Wool Producers Australia uh, just, a week, just last week to discuss the contribution wool growers make to our economy uh, and how our broader manufacturing plan will support them, for example, through improved animal health and stock feed production. Now, the government's strategy is a commitment to play to our strengths. If we're going to tur turbocharge job creation and affect meaningful change in manufacturing, then we need to focus on our investment, on investment in areas where we know we can get the best return. That's why we're focusing on our six national manufacturing priorities resources, technology and critical mineral processing, food and beverage, medical products, recycling and clean energy, defence and space. Our strategy reflects the fact that we're serious about helping our manufacturers achieve the competitiveness, scale and resilience that will make our nation stronger, not just for the recovery Order, from Senator COVID, Seselja. but Time for generations to come. Expired. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Can the minister outline the opportunities provided by the Manufacturing Modernisation Fund for our food, fibre and beverage industries to plan for their futures and improve their competitiveness and productivity? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, yes, I can. I thank Senator McKenzie for the question. The second round of our Manufacturing Modernisation Fund is targeted at small and medium-sized businesses in our priority areas, including food and beverage. Now, these projects will have a particular focus on new technologies, which will make the businesses more competitive and productive, which in turn will create new jobs. Now, there's been huge interest from businesses in our priority sectors, with over 500 applications received from businesses right across Australia. And the Senator and the Senate will be pleased to know there is a very healthy number from regional areas. Now, these are now being assessed and the successful businesses will receive support of between $100,000 and $1 million. Uh, this is matched funding uh, where we provide $1 for every $3 that the business does. Now, this government is backing Aussie manufacturers that are prepared to back themselves, which is all part of our plan to create jobs, to grow the economy right across the nation. 
Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister also outline how the strategy will assist all manufacturing industries under each national priority to strengthen our sovereignty and supply chain resilience, particularly for food and fibre harvesting and processing? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, COVID has demonstrated that we must increase the nation's resilience to supply chain disruption, to protect our economy and security into the future. Now, the Liberal National Government uh, is working with industry to identify the goods and services most critical to Australians. Uh, that's why part of the modern manufacturing strategy, uh, as part of it, we are investing over $107 million in the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative to help Australia be better prepared for any future shocks. Uh, we're looking right across the supply chains, from medical products our doctors and nurses need, to the chemicals required for packaging and for our farmers to grow their crops, or indeed the equipment to harvest and process our food. From there, we'll look at a range of solutions, whether that's establishing or scaling up domestic manufacturing, ensuring the capacity to pivot to meet, to meet surge demand, or working with other like-minded countries to make sure that Australia is more safe and more secure. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, uh, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. I asked you yesterday about whether Brittany Higgins's alleged rapist had ongoing access to this building to meet with ministers uh, and ministerial and departmental staff. I'm still waiting on that reply. If he was issued with a lobbyist pass, a member of parliament would have had to have attested that he was of good character to grant him unaccompanied access to the building. Without a pass, he would have needed to have been signed in to the building by a pass holder. Did any member of parliament or ministerial staff member authorise the alleged rapist's access to the building after he left his role in Minister Reynolds's office? And if so, who? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank, uh, thank the Senator for the question. You did, uh, you did ask uh, those questions yesterday. I have been seeking information in relation to uh, those questions and some related ones that were asked yesterday. Uh, I apologise that I haven't provided to the Chamber um, the particulars of those that you have asked yet, which I received just prior to question time, uh, but, uh, but some of the other matters I'm still securing answers on. In terms of the particulars of the questions that you have asked, uh, I have consulted with the President uh, and the Prime Minister with the Speaker, uh, because access to the building is, uh, as you would appreciate, Senator Waters, managed by the presiding officers, not by, uh, not by the government. Uh, in relation to the question of a sponsored pass or lobbyist pass, uh, I'm advised by the President uh, that the individual did not have access to such a pass, uh, and therefore, obviously, uh, nobody had um, sponsored or, uh, or acknowledged the facts that, uh, that you have identified. Uh, in relation to overall access to the building in terms of being signed in, um, the President has advised me uh, that, as you would appreciate uh, from signing people in yourself, they are manual handwritten logs of people who are signed in. Um, obviously, for pass issues, there is an electronic record, uh, but the singular visitation is a manual log uh, that is kept across the building. Um, uh, that would obviously be a very resource and intensive effort for DPS security to go back over those manual logs and try to ascertain uh, the names of any individuals who had uh, entered the building. Um, uh, of course, there are also public areas uh, of the building, Senator Waters, uh, for which um, people are free to come and go and for which no record is kept. So I'm unable to say categorically that he never uh, re-entered the building, uh, but I can say categorically that he was not uh, issued with a sponsored pass uh, or gained sponsored access uh, in any knowledge uh, to the building subsequent to his termination. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Th uh, thanks, President. Uh, Minister, what exactly has Mr Gaitchens been tasked with investigating? Is it the information available to and the actions taken by the Prime Minister and his office only, or is it the broader mishandling of Brittany Higgins's rape allegations? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, the broader issues uh, that, uh, that are being addressed uh, will be addressed by the independent multi-party uh, review process that, uh, that I have described in this place uh, and for which I am undertaking consultations with uh, all parties 
uh, and, uh, and with staff from different parties uh, and other experts in the field to ensure that we establish a terms of reference and a review process in which everyone can have confidence. Uh, the work that Mr Gaitchens is doing uh, is in specific relation uh, to the handling uh, of the particular incident. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, uh, President. I asked yesterday whether Mitch, Mr Gaitchens' report would be made public and didn't get a response. Can you confirm whether it will be made public and whether there's any truth to the suggestion that it will be released this week and is thus the ultimate tick and flick exercise? Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. I understand the Prime Minister has advised that, uh, that he has not made decisions in relation to the public release of information there, uh, which obviously uh, may have implications for the police investigation that may ensue uh, following the meetings that we understand to be occurring tomorrow afternoon. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, and it relates to some answers given in question time today. Uh, in an earlier answer today, the Minister indicated to the Senate for the first time that, in fact, she met with the AFP twice, first on the 1st of April and the second meeting on the 4th of April. In relation to the meeting of the 1st of April, the Minister asserted twice uh, in question time today that that was a meeting in which she commenced alone with the AFP, but then the meeting included both her Chief of Staff and Ms Higgins. Does the Minister stand by that answer? Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, look, thank you very much, Mr. President. And what I will do is I will take that question on notice, and I'll come. Uh, Mr. President, I will I will check, I will check what I said yesterday and what I said today against my recollections, and I will come back at the first opportunity, Mr. President, uh, to Order. to clarify. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Um, I'm advised that Ms Higgins says she never attended a meeting with the AP with the Minister. Can I ask, therefore, why the Minister made that assertion on at least two occasions to the Senate today? Senator Reynolds. Uh, look, thank you very much, Mr President. As I've said, I will go back and uh, check what I said yesterday, check what I've said today, and I will come back to the Chamber in the first opportunity. Um, Mr President, I am... I am uh, rec recalling and making sure that, uh, that I'm recalling uh, to the best of my recollections about the circumstances two years ago. So I will go back and I've checked what I've said and I'll get back to the chamber. Senator Wong, final supplementary. Minister, I again give you the opportunity. You gave this answer some 10 minutes ago. Do you stand by the answer you gave in question time today that you attended not one but two meetings with the AFP, the first of which included Ms Higgins. Senator Reynolds. Uh, Mr President, look, as I've said, I will go back and I will check uh, my records of my recollections and I'll get back to the given Order. the given the importance Order. and the seriousness of the question, I will get back and come back to the chamber at the first possible opportunity to answer that question. Order. Senator Bragg. I thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Can the Minister update the Senate on what the Morrison government is doing to increase Australian research capacity by leveraging supercomputing power? Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bragg a lot for this question. In fact, I'm extraordinarily grateful for this question because only just this morning, just this morning, I had the pleasure of visiting the National Compu um, Computational Infrastructure Facility at the ANU, and I met somebody called Gaddy, or something called Gaddy. Gaddy is, in fact, the most powerful supercomputer in the Southern Hemisphere, and in fact, the 27th most powerful supercomputer in the world. The Morrison government is very proud to have supported this remarkable technology with $70 million allocated in 2019, Senator Carr, to get this supercomputer up and running, supporting jobs in the Australian research and technology industry. And it's right here. It's right here in Canberra on the ANU, cam on the ANU campus. 
I met with Associate Director Alan Higgins, Professor Sean Smith and Vice-Chancellor Brian Schmidt, who told me that it's already been put to work by a large community of researchers from the likes of CSIRO, from the Bureau of Meteorology, from Geoscience Australia and, of course, from ANU itself. Now, Mr President, you may not know this, but Gadi actually means to search for in the language of the Ngunnawal people, and that's exactly what Gadi does. It allows researchers this, to process extraordinary amounts of data in search of answers to some of our most challenging questions. For example, it's been leveraged to, to uh, build complex genomic data set for studies into cancer, into diabetes, into lupus and into heart disease. And in fact, ANU astronomers are using their time with Gaddy to better understand how stars form. A team of chemists have been incorporating the supercomputer into its search for a COVID-19 treatment. Both CSIRO and Geoscience Australia will also use the supercomputer to improve their own systems aimed at predicting extreme weather patterns, including fires, earthquakes, tsunamis and cyclones. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. Can the minister outline what the government is doing to support world-leading research in complex data-intensive projects right here on Australian soil? Senator Hume. Oh, thank you, Mr President. It's hard to overstate just the extraordinary utility of a facility like Gaddy. It has 155,000 processor cores. It can transfer data at 200 gigabits per second within the supercomputer itself. Now, trust me, I know there's a few people in this room that aren't tech heads, but that is incredibly fast. How fast, I hear you ask? A 4K film can be downloaded in well under a second. I heard you ask how fast. In 2019-20, Gaddy supported over 1,125 1, research projects, with over 6,000 units across Australia allocating 756 million hours of computing time. Mr President, that is an extraordinary amount of number crunching to support world-leading and potentially life-changing research right here in Australia. Yeah. 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 Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Yeah, thank you very much. Can the minister explain what the Gaddy supercomputer is researching that will benefit Australians now and into the future? Order, Senator Ayres. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr President. Well, as Lucy Guest at the NCI told me today, pick a field of science and that's where you'll find a benefit. For example, the NCI's partnership with the Bureau of Meteorology enables increasingly accurate weather predictions, knowing where and how rain will fall, Order. where frost will set Order in, on my enables left. our agricultural sector. Order on my left, I can't quite enables hear the minister. our agricultural sector to, and our farmers to make far better choices, to optimise yield, to minimise cost and minimise waste. I understand that Senator Watt believes that supercomputing is something that involves wearing your underpants on the outside and watching funny cat videos, but that's not what we're doing here. In fact, Gaddy is helping build more accurate models of fire movement, helping to predict bushfire behaviour and save lives and save livelihoods. With researchers leveraging Gaddy to help the model of the next generation personalised genomic medicine, Australians are indeed people around the world can look forward to improved treatments for rare diseases Order. like cancers Senator and Hume, more. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks Mr President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator Hume for giving Senator Watt the sort of fashion sense of former Senator Conroy uh, in her answer there and ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Patrick, are you seeking the call? Uh, just a moment, Senator Patrick. I don't think there's any sound. Let's just start again. I'll call you again. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, uh, in accordance with Standing Order 164, I'm uh, seeking an explanation as, uh, from uh, the Minister for Defence as to why she has not responded to the Senate's order of the 11th of November 2020 to provide documents to the Senate Economics Committee. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Minister? Uh, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Patrick for raising this issue with me earlier. Uh, in relation to this, I can confirm that we actually have complied uh, with that oh, order. Okay. However, 
I did receive uh, further correspondence from Senator Gallagher in response to my letter in relation to access to these documents. I received that uh, correspondence from Senator Gallagher on the 19th of November, and I am in the process of responding to that. Sorry, 19th of February. And Thank you. you. Senator Patrick. I, I rise to take note of the minister's explanation. The status of these documents at the moment, just so, the, so that the chamber is very clear, the, the chamber has asked for documents to be uh, returned to the Senate Economics Committee, and that's very important because uh, rather than coming back to the Senate table, uh, where they are public, uh, responsibly the committee has asked for these documents to be sent to the committee itself. Thereby, uh, uh, they can be managed in terms of their confidentiality. Unfortunately, all that has been provided to the committee is a series of redacted documents that do not let the committee go to its fundamental uh, task um, required of it by the Senate, by, by the Senate, to examine. Australia's naval, uh, sovereign naval shipbuilding capability. So uh, we end up uh, with a problem, and, and I'll just lay out what the problem is. And this is a really important uh, issue, not just for uh, the, the inquiry into naval shipbuilding, but for the Senate more generally. The proposition that has been put forward by Defence in advancing a public interest immunity is that they have signed a contract with Naval Group, and uh, and, and other uh, providers, so that would be uh, BAE, uh, Lurson and so forth, and that those contracts have confidentiality conditions. And because uh, we have uh, confidentiality conditions in these contracts, uh, th they are of the view that they cannot provide them to the Senate on the basis that, uh, if they do so, it may uh, uh, undermine the future provision of information. Unfortunately, uh, what the department hasn't uh, told you is that they correctly, when they signed these contracts, included clauses uh, related to confidentiality that include, included words like this, that, you, that they cannot disclose uh, information except as otherwise required by law. Now, just because defence enters into a contract and it's, uh, that involves confidentiality, and I know that uh, that's important. You need to have confidentiality in these projects so that defence takes care of information, doesn't it hand it over to uh, entities that have no business in seeing it. They take care of it properly. They put it in, sa in, in safes. They also uh, you know, reciprocate. They require Naval Group to make sure they look after our information as well, and that is proper. But you cannot have a clause in a contract oust the jurisdiction of the Senate in its oversight role. Just as it would be preposterous if uh, defence were to claim that a court couldn't get access to, to documents, that a court couldn't subpoena documents because there was something written in a statute. The Senate's powers to obtain documents to carry out its oversight role come from section 49 of our constitution, backed up in the Parliamentary Privileges Act. There can be no question that the Senate has power at law to obtain documents. And it is not possible for the Department of Defence to sign a contract with a, with an, uh, a commercial party to oust that jurisdiction. Simply cannot happen. And unfortunately, that's the proposition that has been presented to the Senate. Now, this time around, it's, it's uh, about a shipbuilding contract. But the next time around, it could be something that other senators are inquiring into and have a department turn around and say, well, we can't give it to the Senate. There's a confidentiality clause in the, in the contract. People can clearly appreciate that that would affect us in the execution of our role, our responsibility, one of which is, of course, to review, examine, pass, modify legislation. The other very important role is to scrutinise the executive. And again, it's written into the contracts. Uh, if I look at the Department of Finance's advice in relation to confidentiality of contracts, they make it very aware that officials need to be mindful of things like uh, FOI, because 
uh, and I know I'm in the AAT in relation to this matter now. Uh, again, if a contract says something is confidential, uh, that is uh, quite legitimate. But to the extent that a statute, something that the parliament commands, grants a citizen a, a right to access, then the contract is void to the, to the extent that it interferes with that statute right. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you just come in and ask for documents under FOI and, you'll be given, and they'll be given to you. Of course, um, that's not the case because the FOI Act provides pr uh, certain protections in relation to confidentiality, but it doesn't rely on the contract. Right now, we can't do our job in the uh, Senate Economics Committee looking into shipbuilding we can't do our job. And it's a really important job. If I just look at one of the programs that we are examining, one of them is the submarine project. And we know that uh, the history of this is back in 2009, uh, it was identified in something called the Defence Capability Plan uh, and the Defence White Paper that we needed to build 12 new submarines. That was a very rough estimate of, bus of budget. Then between 2009 and 2015, a period that, expand, that, uh, that, that uh, expanded across two governments, the, Gillard, the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd uh, government, but also uh, the, um, the, the, the Abbott and Rudd government, sorry, Abbott and uh, Turnbull government, $214 million was allocated to de the Department of Defence to examine the future submarine project, to look at it, work out what might ought to be in, what ought to be out of it, and you know, to presumably build up some reasonable costs. And they came to the conclusion around about 2015, and they gave evidence to uh, a, a Senate Estimates Committee that that project would cost $50 billion outturned, and that would include, just, uh, that would include acquisition and sustainment. We then went through a CEP process, a competitive evaluation process, and out of that process we selected Naval Group as the partner to build our future submarines. But in there, somehow, somehow, the cost of the submarine went from an estimate of $50 billion outturned for sustainment and for um, acquisition to $89 billion outturned. Now, I'm going to ask officials about this when, back uh, at the next estimates. How do you go from uh, a, a proposition that something is, is $50 billion outturned to $89 billion outturned and no one even raises a question? No one even says, how did that happen across the, the CEP? How did we get it so wrong? We spent $214 million was allocated in the lead up to the CEP to try and work out exactly what the, uh, the landscape was. And unfortunately, we, uh, uh, you know, th there was this huge error. Huge error. So now we see a $39,000 million increase in the price of the future submarine. Okay, so Defence will argue it's not a blowout because it was approved by government. What they've done is said, it's your fault. It's your fault on the other side of the chamber. Somehow something went up $39,000 million and no one bothered to raise a question and say, Is that, can, can that be right? Can we have a submarine uh, fleet suddenly go up $39,000 million? That increase is $2.8 million per day for 38 years. That's how much that increase was. I would have thought someone would have said, Hey, what happened? How did we get such a big increase? But no, we just signed off on it. The government just signed off on that project, caught up in a pre-election uh, you know, frenzy, wanting to do, uh, you know, to do good, but in actual fact, looks like they've, uh, they've done harm. And since that time, we know that the project's had problems. And this is one of the things that the, the Economics Committee is examining, is the... Um, uh, you know, how much Australian industry involvement is, in, is, is uh, taking place? How are we building our, our sovereign naval shipbuilding capability in relation to this particular contract? Now, 
uh, under FOI, again, defence resisted a, uh, uh, an OPD, but under FOI I got, I got access to the plans of Naval Group as they went forward, as they made their tender to the Australian government about, uh, uh, about what it is that they thought they could do with Australian industry. It include th included things like partnering with ASC, setting up uh, uh, programs in schools, uh, setting up uh, capability centres, all, so all manner of things. And this committee has started to examine exactly what was offered versus what was contracted. They're the exact documents we're looking to obtain. What did the, the companies that won the job offer to do here in Australia and what has and that way we can look at what has been done, what has been contracted. Very important issues. We heard the minister today, very unusually, the minister stood up at question time in answer to the first question and said, I'm very frustrated with Naval Group because we are not getting what we should out of that contract. We have a committee of the Senate looking into this. And the Department of Defence is refusing to hand over documents. Now, again, to be fair to the minister, the minister, uh, as she alluded to, uh, uh, has in some way sought to try and work out a way to grant access to those, uh, to those documents. But this has been going on for almost a year. If this Senate is to do its job properly, it has to be properly informed and they have to be able to receive information in a timely fashion. Otherwise, we can pack up and go home. Otherwise, we can operate remotely and simply press a button on our office walls whenever there's a vote. If we can't do the oversight role properly, we ought not, to be, here. We ought not be here. <coughs> so it's a very serious issue that I'm talking about. It's not just about naval shipbuilding, it's about the Senate's capacity to do the job that it is required to do under the Australian Constitution. We were granted powers to do those jobs for very good reason. And you know, I, I said this at a Senate committee that was examining uh, certain elements of the D department's refusal to provide the Senate with information. I think we're very close to a privileges res resolution. I think we're very, very close because I can't see how any one of us could watch a committee stand still for six months, for six months waiting for the executive to respond favourably to provide it with the information it needs to do its inquiry. If that's not fettering the ability of a committee to do its work, then I don't know what is. And, you know, Minister Birmingham, I know he's, he's weighed into this issue, but it's very important. You know, one day, people on uh, the, the government side of the chamber will be in opposition and they'll be wanting to do their job properly. I did a, a speech, uh, a couple of, uh, I think it, was, it might have been in 2019, that the Senate has lost its mojo. The Senate has lost its mojo. It, it disheartens me to say that. I watched, uh, I watched the, the House of Commons in seeking to get access to documents from Facebook arrest someone in a hotel, bring them back to the Commons and say to them, you can't leave, if you don't hand over the documents, we're putting you in the cell. That's mojo. That's mojo. We in this place simply, uh, on, on a repetitive basis, ask for, the, for, for documents to be provided and simply ignore the executive when they fail to deliver. Now, I, for one, am not going to let that happen because I take my role as a senator very, very seriously. We are put here by the people of our respective states to do a proper job, and that job involves keeping an eye on the, on the executive scrutinising the executive. Now, I know scrutiny is to the Prime Minister as kryptonite is to Superman. I know he doesn't like it very much, but that is our job and we are empowered to do it 
and we should do it. And we should not accept a claim by the executive that we cannot have access to information to do our job. We are tasked to do that and we should do it and we need the, the, uh, the Department of Defence to comply in this particular instance and uh, the minister needs to direct them to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pat Patrick. Um, minister. Thank, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I rise only very briefly uh, on this matter, but I do wish to, uh, to make a contribution to it. Uh, the scrutiny functions that the parliament undertakes, and in particular uh, that this Senate, as a House of Review, uh, undertakes in this parliament, are of crucial importance and something that I hold in very high regard and of great uh, import to the functioning of the parliament, uh, the government uh, and indeed uh, to our entire system uh, of government. And I acknowledge uh, the important role that uh, individual senators play in this place uh, in driving uh, levels of scrutiny uh, over government decisions and particularly important policy decisions uh, such as those that relate uh, to the procurement uh, of our future defence assets. Uh, I do note that, uh, that um, there are also uh, few things uh, that are perhaps more sensitive in terms of their content uh, than um, documents that relate to the type of assets our defence forces are procuring for the future. Those sorts of, uh, of assets are obviously of high degrees of sensitivity um, and, uh, and do need careful consideration in the approaches that are taken to their scrutiny. Um, I have been pleased to, uh, to uh, try to work with Senator Patrick uh, since, uh, since my appointment as Leader of the Government in the Senate in relation to some of his concerns that he has expressed about access to some of the defence procurement documents. I acknowledge uh, that he is genuinely seeking to scrutinise uh, some of the information uh, within those documents. Uh, I do think that a significant breakthrough was made shortly prior to uh, this fortnight of parliamentary sittings uh, when uh, the Minister for Defence, uh, following uh, further work with her department, uh, offered the members of the Senate Economics Committee um, access to those documents that had been previously redacted for uh, a number of reasons. Uh, and I think it, uh, it um, is notable that a very significant breakthrough occurred and it was a very significant step by defence to provide for access to those tender and procurement related documents for significant uh, defence assets and naval infrastructure uh, and to do so in an unredacted format and to be available to be uh, questioned in confidence uh, about uh, those, uh, those uh, documents. I do encourage members of the Senate Economics Committee to in good faith engage with defence uh, through the process that defence has offered in that regard. To at least do so in good faith initially if there are dissatisfactions following that engagement, well then, by all means, bring those concerns back to the government. Uh, but Defence, I think, has made a very significant step in transparency and in engagement with this chamber, and in particular with senators on the Senate Economics Committee, uh, and I would encourage them uh, to take that up and to use the opportunity that has been provided. Senator Gallagher. Yeah, Madam Deputy President, I too rise to take note of the response of Senator Reynolds, and, and I do, in, uh, you know, endorse the comments made by Senator Birmingham. I think he has been a circuit breaker in what's been an extremely unusual and vexed uh, uh, inquiry. And look, I've done a couple of inquiries since I've been here. As I've languished on the back bench, I've learned all about Senate standing orders, procedures, and inquiries, but I've never run into this level of intransigence. And I honestly it had no political perspective in the pursuit of this inquiry. To me, it looks straight up and down, scrutinised expenditure, plans and, um, and progress in an extremely important area of defence policy. And I had the opportunity of opening up a, uh, a hearing quite recently and I said to the Secretary of uh, Defence, I'll start for a few moments. I'm not looking at this from any particular perspective, perspective other than the Senate gave the committee a reference. 
you'd be very familiar with the terms of reference. And amongst the terms of reference is the ongoing examination of contracts, scrutiny of expenditure, the department's performance, when we have requested this information, has been nothing short of abysmal. You have redacted publicly available information and sent it to us. It is almost like you have a giant forefinger up to the operation of this committee. It has now been to the Senate to get orders. I accept that you have a case on commercial and confidential uh, matters and all of the rest of the things. But in the ordinary course of this committee's activity, I as chair personally feel, and I'm sure there are other members of the committee who feel the same way, that defence has been absolutely obtuse, arrogant, dismissive and contemptuous of the work of a Senate committee duly given a reference by the Senate. So it's a pretty strong opening line for a, uh, to a departmental secretary, but I don't resign from it because the people who are resourcing uh, the Senate committee, the good people of the Secretariat, were becoming absolutely flabbergasted at the, the information that was given to us, the way it was presented to us, uh, was almost uh, unseen before. And I have done a little bit of work with Defence. You know, I did chair the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee. And we went through some exceedingly uh, contentious um, private issues and we dealt with an enormous amount of stuff that may need to be visible in camera. And it appears, though, that all of those sort of protocols and procedures have been forgotten uh, by defence. So in the Veterans Affairs uh, area where we had a a whole stack of in-camera documents made available to senators, and I say senators, not voting senators, as they tried to prescribe here recently, to senators, um, over a period of time, you'd sign in, you'd be able to access the information, you couldn't copy it or take it away, but you could view it, you could form your opinion, and you could come back and um, you know make your contribution. And I well remember Senator Force had been exceedingly diligent in that area. Personally, I only have to read one tale of distress. I don't need to read a hundred, but there were other senators like Senator Lambie, Senator Fawcett, who went in camera and they went through the whole lot. And the end result was, this is the really interesting thing, the end result was we produced a report which had 26 recommendations. The government accepted every one of them and the Department of Veterans Affairs actually put money behind some of the initiatives that were suggested. So good work can come out of difficult areas. Good work can come <coughs> out of difficult areas, but not providing the information to people is absolutely not conducive to a great outcome. Now, Senator Reynolds left the chamber, and basically that's why I need to uh, put on the record, that she had written to me, setting out a pathway forward, and that I'd written back to her and she was responding to that. Well, the problem with the Senator Birmingham and uh, Senator Reynolds' response basically was that this has been an order for production by the Senate twice. Senator Patrick is quite entitled to look for a privileges outcome here. I foreshadowed that this type of activity could occur every sitting day until we get resolution to the Department of Defence and clearly, obviously, as a public hearing to the Minister. Now, what the, um, the Minister has sought to do was to... Senators will be able to view the documents at a secure location in Canberra. This will be available to voting members of the committee only. Now, clearly, that condition um, is a breach of standing orders. And, and that's what's been sent straight back to her, is you, all members of the Senate are participating members, members of all committees and therefore can go and participate in all inquiries. And to say it's voting members only uh, is wrong, it's against standing orders, and that has been uh, uh, clearly pointed out 
the requ this request contravening Standing Orders 25 7C, which state that participating members may participate in hearings of evidence and the deliberations of the committee, have all the rights of the committee but may not vote. So they can get all the information, they just can't vote on the outcome of it. So <coughs> we're uh, not quite as close as Senator Birmingham uh, um, alleges, but I do say that he has intervened to good measure a couple of times. But at the nut of it all is this. I said to our committee secretary, can you reach out to the Department of Defence and say, we are not unique. This is a reference. You can see the terms of reference. These are requests. You know the standing orders. Can we get somewhere closer? Can we get somewhere closer? Is there an area where we can start seeing a regular flow of information to allow the committee to do its work? To allow the committee to do its work. And if you need to argue <coughs> commercial incompetence, you'll either win or lose that. And you're losing it. Senator Patrick has come to the committee, put on the table freedom of information outcomes which clearly say the defence was wrong in hiding the stuff from the committee. There's, just no, there's, no, there's no ifs and buts about it. The freedom of information stuff that he's got, some of it actually states that they should be able to be made available to the committee. So we've been <coughs> passing the parcel in a very difficult area. I don't know whether it's in the ministerial office that this intransigence and reluctance to cooperate with the Senate committee is, or whether it's in defence. I fired a shot over to Secretary Moriarty's bow and said, I reckon you were given us a giant forefinger. Tell us why you're not and improve your performance. Because this doesn't stop in a reference. All it does is transfer to estimates. And then you have another you know, whole heap of departmental officers you know, uh, working away on questions on notice and the like. Why can't we have what the Constitution says? There's a, you know, there's a parliament and there's an executive. And this Senate gave us a job of scrutinising performance, uh, capability and money. Well, what, where's the big issue here? And every time they raise an issue, Senator Patrick, Senator Patrick actually trumps them with, well, by the way, under freedom of information, I got that, and it says here it shouldn't have been classified in the first place. So, look, I won't take up any more of the Senate's time, but I think it is really important that we allow our Senate committees to do what they do best, scrutinise expenditure. I mean, the audit office will come down eventually and say, God almighty, what happened here? But in the meantime, we might be able to point someone on the pathway to good outcomes. Uh, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Patrick to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Um, Senator Polly. Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Reynolds to questions asked by Senators Wong, Gallagher, Eyre and myself. Now, what we've seen in this chamber day after day from the Minister for Defence is somebody who cannot remember, doesn't understand the processes, has done nothing to protect the privacy of Ms Higgins, but yet she comes into this place and she hides behind her words saying that she, she wants Ms Higgins to be able to give her recollections herself and that she's trying to uh, pay uh, respect to Ms Higgins' privacy. Well, Ms Higgins' response to those statements that have been given in this place and elsewhere is, I don't think she has ever been concerned about my privacy. She wasn't concerned about my privacy when she met with the Assistant Minister of, uh, Assistant Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police behind my back. What has been so disappointing about this whole sordid affair is that Ms Higgins, who has made a very serious allegation of rape in the office of the Minister for Defence, is that every time this minister comes into the chamber and refuses to give a full and frank account of what she did in terms of 
supporting Ms Higgins, referring the matter to the AFP, informing the Prime Minister of this country, we have seen nothing but failure on behalf of this minister. And so Ms Higgins, who now in this chamber during question time, the minister all but called her a liar. That's what she did. So the effect that this is having... Um, Senator Polly, please resume your seat. Madam Deputy Senator Chair, Brockman. under 1933, this is getting very, very close, if not over the line, of a direct imputation against a member of this place. And I would ask you to listen carefully to what is being said. I certainly will. I think, uh, as you pointed out, I think the senator came close, but uh, not quite all the way there. Well, I'll be guided by the clerk if he thinks otherwise. Um, yes, I think uh, the senator has come close, Senator Brockman, and I'll continue to pay close attention. And uh, I'd invite Senator Polly, if she thinks there was an imputation she wishes to withdraw, to take that opportunity to do so. But please continue. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The minister today in this chamber said that Ms Higgins had her recollections and she has a right to tell that story. But I believe there's Ms Higgins has a right to be heard, to be listened to and to be supported and to be respected. Now, this is a terrible message that we're sending out to young women and, to, in fact, to young men who work in this place, that they cannot be assured that they're going to have the support of their minister or their senator or their member when something that is unacceptable, that is in uh, contrary to Australian law, that they won't first have their back by their boss, that they won't refer the issue straight away to the Australian Federal Police. It is just extraordinary. And so what we had today is a minister who comes in here and says, well, I had a, yes, I did have a, uh, a meeting with the Assistant Commissioner of the AFP only after the Prime Minister already made that public in the other place. And she said she had that meeting, and yesterday she couldn't tell us whether anyone else attended that meeting, but today she said, well, I did have a meeting. In fact, I had two meetings, and on the 1st of April, I, um, my chief of staff came and joined me. And then she came back later, and what she said is, to further question from Senator Wong is, oh, I don't know. I will have to take that on notice. I will have to take it on notice. Now, this is a serious issue, and I have no doubt that the minister has put herself under an immense pressure with this situation. But she should have been fully briefed, fully prepared to know whether or not she had meetings with the assistant commissioner, whether her chief of staff was there or not, when Miss Higgins was there, but now she's got to go and check those facts. This does nothing to assure the Australian people or anyone else that listens in to Parliament, and with the amount of phone calls that I know myself and my colleagues are receiving in our offices, they have little faith in this minister. They have little faith that this has not been covered up. And in fact, some would assert that the cover-up goes right from the top, from the Prime Minister, who remarkably says that he only found out on Monday that there was a, an alleged rape in the minister's office. Well, for anyone who's been in this place for even a short period of time, you know that there's nothing that goes on in this place without this gossip and innuendo about what's been happening. So it's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary effort on this minister to cover up a oh, real crime. I beg your pardon. Sorry, um, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Polly, Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Sensitive issues like this deserve to be treated with respect. It's got to be considered that the, these matters are fraught with exceptional difficulty. And whilst I'm sure Senator Polly has huge qualities as a senator and is multi-skilled, 
I would suggest to her that it is highly inappropriate for her or indeed any other senator to come into this place and pretend to be so multi-skilled that you can be the investigator, the prosecutor, the judge and the jury all in one matter, especially one as sensitive as this. And now in a former life, Deputy President, um, I defended people who were accused of heinous offences and indeed represented victims who were the subject of heinous offences. Indeed, uh, one of the privileges I had before entering parliament was being a uh, founding executive member and honorary legal advisor to a women's shelter where issues of this nature often arose. You've got to be sensitive. You've got to treat uh, people that come with their stories with respect. We also have in Australia, thankfully, in the concept of innocent until proven guilty, you've got to treat these cases exceptionally, exceptionally carefully. And uh, what I would invite all senators to do is to leave this matter to the independent body that uh, it has now been uh, established, uh, where the Minister for Finance is seeking to ensure that this matter is dealt with in a manner that takes it out of the political realm. Sure, some people think that you can get some tawdry political advantage by going on a personal demolition derby against the minister, but the minister herself has been consistent throughout this matter in her responses, seeking to protect the person making the allegations. That is an appropriate course of action, a proper course of action, an honourable course of action, especially in circumstances when political opponents are seeking to apply a blowtorch to her. It might be very easy for her to say, well, here it all is. Instead, she has retained her dignity. She has retained the exact same approach that she has from day one. And I think that is indicative of character, discernment and judgment. And so for the Labor Party to try to run this tawdry exercise against the minister on a personal basis really does, I think, the Labor Party a great disservice. And one assumes also the lady making the complaint also a great disservice. We are not here to determine what the facts of the circumstances or the case may be. On the face of it, I've got to say, it looks pretty ugly, pretty horrific, and uh, clearly it is an exceptionally, exceptionally serious matter. So should it be bounced around this chamber and in the other place and people trying to make uh, uh, some political uh, point-scoring exercise out of it? I think not. What we need, Madam Deputy President, is uh, genuine sincerity, a careful treatment of this matter to ensure that everybody's rights are protected and, what is more, when the particular circumstances, or sorry, not when, whilst the particular circumstances of this case are being fully investigated and determined as to whether, for example, a prosecution should or should not take place, that should be independently considered first by the Federal Police and then the Director of Public Prosecutions. And whilst that's occurring, let us all work together to ensure that anybody that has a complaint of this nature has a proper pathway to go forward to ensure that there is a clear mechanism. And surely that should have been part and parcel and the thrust of Senator Polly and the Labor Party contribution today. Sadly not. It was all cheap, tawdry personal attacks against the minister. I, for one, the Prime Minister and the whole coalition look forward to seeing a pathway being developed for the protection of all the staff thank that you, work Senator in this Abetz, place. Your time has expired. Uh, I've got two people standing. Uh, thank you. Senator Gallagher. Yes. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Deputy President, and uh, I rise to take note of answers uh, questions, and in particular Senator Wong's question to 
Senator Reynolds. But before I, uh, um, I go to that matter, I'd, I'd just like to, well, in, in a sense, congratulate Senator Abetz on his contribution there. But there was one great big glaring hole in all of that contribution. On the night that this happened, no one rang the police. And I will shake my head forever why a security guard, a ministerial advisor, a DPS staffer or Senator Reynolds never thought to ring the police about what was clearly a serious crime that had been committed in this parliament. So, the business that I want to refer to at the moment is Senator Reynolds' non-answer, once again falling on a track record of non-answers to the uh, Naval Committee, uh, to the Naval Shipbuilding Inquiry and the Economics Committee. She did it again today. When asked, why have you not made a decision, which you said you'd do in 2019, she referred to our term of government and her, her government's investment in shipbuilding and submarines and the like. Where is the difficulty with this minister coming to grips with a decision which he'd foreshadowed? Why is it such a ongoing uh, black cloud over, over South Australia as to where this is? Why are there 750 workers wondering whether they've got a job or not? In an area where we should be looking at confirming their position in recruiting more boilermakers, recruiting more engineers, recruiting more shipbuilding workers. There appears to be a continual hiatus in that office, a continual procrastination, a continual lack of decision making. And, you know, if you look at the debacle that's played itself out in the, in the parliament for the last week or so, uh, there's a, there clearly doesn't appear to be any strong ministerial leadership, any strong uh, r r capability within the office. It seems to meander along from one disaster to the next. And when we in the uh, Naval uh, Shipbuilding Inquiry and the like uh, try to seek information about what capability plans are uh, available, what expenditure is happening? Where are the pla we get stonewalled? We get literally told, commercial incompetence can't see it, can't do it. So it's quite extraordinary. And I, I well remember asking questions of David Johnson, the former se uh, senator from West Australia, who was the, uh, the Minister of Defence, and he'd give you a response. You may not like the response. And a matter of fact, the one famous day in this chamber, he gave us a response that no one liked. I wouldn't trust you to build a canoe, is what he said about South Australian workers. I wouldn't trust ASC to build a canoe. Shortly after that, he uh, changed his uh, career projection and went and probably on to bigger and better things than the Defence Minister. But he was never short of expertise and intelligent answers. But this minister appears to be bereft of expertise in her office and refuses to answer almost everything. There is, there is literally almost not a question which we can craft that this minister will not find a way of avoiding. And we're not playing trumps here. Defence is not an overtly political area. Outside of decisions about where things are made, outside of uh, where things are produced, or where money is spent, once those decisions are made, people like to just go on and examine how progress is. And dare I say this, a government will never fall in Australia because defence is overspent. It's almost inclined to overspend on everything it does. It often has three or four projects of concern requiring the attention of the Treasury, <coughs> the Finance Minister, and the Defence Minister to try and get them back on track. So to have a minister who just blatantly refuses to provide information to properly constituted committees of the Senate and then in question time won't provide answers to questions she knows. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. <sighs> 
This has been an incredibly difficult period for, for a lot of women. Certainly for Miss Higgins, but there's been a lot of women, and I know across the aisle uh, they would understand this, um, lots of women have experienced abuse, assault, sexual harassment, uh, rape, uh, and for a multitude of reasons, a lot of these women determine that they want to keep it private. And it's not just one reason why they keep it private, it's for a whole lot of reasons. But there are experiences that occur not just in Parliament House, experiences that have occurred not just through our own political parties, uh, but through a variety of experiences in different times of their life. And I find it absolutely and utterly shameful, this politicisation of Miss Higgins' experiences. The lack of sympathy for her, of understanding of her, the fact that it has been a number of years since this occurred and things change for people over time. Lots changes for lots of people at different times. And Miss Higgins at the time decided not to pursue uh, a police investigation that was offered to her. And as this week has unfolded, at one stage, Senator Reynolds was being criticised for not respecting her privacy. Uh, but now, but as it unfolds, that Miss Senator Reynolds actually was respectful of her privacy by maintaining uh, a very dignified silence and is continuing to do so around Miss Higgins' situation. Uh, that somehow now those opposite are claiming that sh those wishes should have been disrespected, those wishes should have been ignored, that somehow they know best as what was happening at that specific time and that Senator Reynolds should have just ignored the wishes of Miss Higgins. The wishes that Senator Reynolds respected, that she listened to, and she supported Miss Higgins throughout this and offered at every opportunity that she could her support to go with Miss Higgins, to support her both in a physical sense and being present and in whatever way that she wanted. Uh, this was also obviously followed up by Senator Cash also offering to go with her to make a police report. This is actual support. By trying to take down one woman whilst alleging to support another, you should be ashamed of yourselves. Absolutely and utterly ashamed of yourselves. And I guess one of the things that also upsets me, and I think upsets and confounds a lot of people, is your willingness to attack Senator Reynolds, your willingness, like Senator Gallagher just did, absolutely outrageously claiming Senator Reynolds should have called the police on the night the incident occurred. If you want to be angry with the security guards for not doing it, sure, fair enough. Senator Reynolds didn't know about it on the night that it occurred. In fact, she didn't learn about it for a couple of days when she was told about a security breach, is my understanding, not about an incident that occurred. So you can't just rewrite history because it suits your disgraceful narrative. During the last election campaign, another woman made some allegations and a lot on the other side of the chamber were pretty quick to dismiss those, pretty quick to diminish that woman, pretty quick to race to the defence of their then leader I hope you've all had a good hard look at yourself with this faux outrage and this absolutely pathetic effort that you're trying to do against Minister Reynolds. I hope you are reaching out to Miss Sheriff and offering support to her and absolutely abhorrent behaviour trying to tear down one woman with a rewriting of history who did absolutely everything by the book as required. The minister in charge of defence industry, the minister who was told of a security breach, not of an incident, and now we're rewriting history to suit an absolutely disgraceful agenda. But I am wondering at what time the Labor Party or anyone else in this chamber might actually find a little outrage for the alleged perpetrator. Perhaps even Miss Wilkinson, who left it to the 29th minute of that interview to even mention him. Perhaps at some stage you might realise that there was someone else that actually inflicted this alleged attack on Miss Higgins. But yet we have silence total silence of anger or empathy or you know, any feelings towards alleged perpetrators and what he, he allegedly contributed Thank to, you, to Ms Higgins. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Your time has expired.
Senator McCarthy. Madam Deputy President, what's missing here is leadership. What's missing here is the inability of a minister to provide a timeline of duty of care, of responsibility, of questions by senators to the Senate. What's missing here is the inability of a minister to talk straight, to talk honestly, consistently. Every minister in this cabinet has a responsibility to this parliament. Every minister. So when they are questioned, whether in the Senate or in the House, they have a responsibility to be able to respond to the questions. There is no disagreement around the need to have absolute empathy, sincere concern for a young woman whose story has been shown right across this country. We're not fighting over who feels more disgusted in what occurred here. What we demand to know in this Senate, Madam Deputy President, is the duty of care and responsibility of those in power, of those who are responsible for others, of those who are responsible for the duty of care of their staff. That is a question that we will continue to ask, Madam Deputy President. That is a question we must ask. To not do so would be an abrogation of our responsibility. Because right now, Madam Deputy President, the one who is abrogating that responsibility is the minister herself, is the prime minister himself. Because these questions must be asked and they must be answered. Because we have hundreds of staffers in this building. We have hundreds of workers in this building. And the rest of the country wants to know that we are able to reach to the highest of levels above all political persuasion to make this place a safe place. When the minister comes in here with one response, to a question by a senator and then changes that response to a next question by a next senator, then we deserve the right to pursue this minister to hear the truth. What is your truth telling here, minister? Do the right thing. Speak your truth. Because all we hear is hidden messages ducking and weaving. You are a leader in this government. You are supposed to be a leader in this Senate. You have a responsibility and duty of care, not only to those around you, but to our country as the Defence Minister. If you cannot, Minister, speak straight and honest in here, in the Senate, where you must be held accountable, then how can any Australian expect you to be doing that out there? How can our defence forces expect you to be doing that out there? When we ask you questions about the AFP, about your role in your meetings with them, you need to be clear. In one response today, you said one thing about the AFP. Ten minutes later, you couldn't remember what you'd said about the AFP. It is our duty as senators in this Senate to ask these questions. There is no challenge to who feels more disgusted and angered by the events of these past fortnight. And in fact, the past couple of years, only Miss Higgins holds that. But we as senators, have to pursue what we believe is the right thing to do, and that is to understand, Minister, the honesty and the truth-telling 
that is yet to come from you. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Polly be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Seawitt, and I just quickly remind you of the 4 p.m. hard marker. Uh, yes, okay, sorry. Um, I rise to take note of the answer by the Minister for Social Services to my questions on the increase in the job seeker payment. This is an outrageous act by this government. $25 a week. What century are they living in? I'll tell you, the last century, because the Prime Minister admitted it when he referred back to the days of John Howard when he was talking about this increase. The Minister could not answer my question as to whether she could survive on $44 a day because that's because she couldn't and she knows it. It is outrageous. This government knows you can't live on $44 a day. They knew you couldn't live on $40 a day, which is why they've introduced the coronavirus supplement during the pandemic. The Prime Minister has broken the hearts of every job seeker across this country because they have been condemned, deliberately condemned, to live in poverty, which is outrageous in a country as wealthy as Australia. He had a duty to support job seekers, and what he's done is condemned them to poverty. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. The question is: the motion moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.